good afternoon, and it is a pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of Wichita State University and the Business Development Center to our workshop, How to Downsize to Survive, in our, in our series of the new normal. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you with us, and also I wanted to introduce you to my, my co-host, and we'll start with uh, Vicki Long. She is our HR specialist, and she will be talking on the issues regarding HR and talent when it comes down to downsize. Also, we have with us uh, Abdul Arif. He is a local attorney that deals with a lot of uh, business issues. He deals uh, with um, different things in the in the business arena, but he also is an entrepreneur. He is uh, owner of several business, so he brings a good combination to the table, uh, being our legal expert in downsizing and some of the things that we're going to be touching on, but he also has an entrepreneurial perspective. And of course, I am I'm Frank Corriego. I'm the uh, Associate Director here at the Business Development Center at Wichita State. And we're going to go ahead and get started with this. Just a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, I want to thank you to um, Caleb Johnston and Emily Richel. Emily is our marketing specialist and she will be handling the questions. What we would ask you to do is if you have any questions to please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen and post the question. Emily will be collecting all the questions. Uh, usually what happens in these situations, we have more than one question regarding the same topic. And what she does is she consolidates the questions and we address those at the end uh, so people have the opportunity to get the answers that they're looking for. So once again, thank you. And we'll go ahead and get started covering this, these topics. How to downsize to survive is something that we thought long and hard before we decided to roll it out. But really, after uh, things are starting to opening again, after all the things that happened with the stimulus package and, and the different ways that that um, effort when we felt that it was necessary to do this because several of the businesses that we are dealing with that are assisting with uh, life is not the same that it used to be and they are facing uh, different different subjects different situations very uh, nothing like it was six months ago unlike it was you know before Christmas of last of 20. 19. So we feel this is necessary. Go ahead and let's uh, roll down to the next slide and we'll go ahead and get started. So the shelter in place went away. COVID seems to be going down. There's other challenges in the world that we've always had challenges. But uh, some of us in our business are realizing that things are not what we expected. Things are not what they used to be, and frankly, we're struggling. So how do we know if we need to downsize? It sounds like a, um, like a rhetorical question, but it is not. Sometimes we keep holding on, holding on, thinking that maybe it's good, things are gonna turn around tomorrow. But there's a point in the business world where we need, need to face the facts and deal with that situation. So the first thing that we need to look at is at the economy in general. How are things going? Is everything rebounding? How are the financial markets? How are the global markets? How are the supply chains? Are these things really truly coming back to normal or the disruption, at least in the areas that concern our business, seems to be uh, that is lasting longer than it should or they have completely changed. Then we go look at the market. Are the transactions taking place the way they used to? Are you seeing the same numbers of clients, the same number of customers? What is the consumer behavior in the areas that we used to, we're used to dealing with? Are there 
shopping patterns changing? Are their needs changing? Are their demands changing? Or are they the way they used to be? They're just sl slow in number. And what are the trends on that economy and that market? Are they going up a little bit at a time, staying flat? Or are they not only the same that they used to be, but they're also going down? What's specifically, what's our industry doing? I'm in the car business, I'm in the apparel business, I'm in the manufacturing business, uh, industrial ag, I'm in the service business, distribution business, uh, health and beauty, uh, wellness. What business, what industry am I I'm in and how is that industry as a whole doing? And last but not least, how is my business doing? What happens when I compare this month P&L with last June P&L. What happens when I compare the first six months of 2020 with the first six months of 2019? What is happening to my business? And when we look at all these four things, we're going to know if it's time to seriously look at downsizing. Uh, the next slide, please. Okay, some of us are dealing with some um, I don't know, we got a shot in the arm with some of the programs from the stimulus package. It's almost $4 trillion that we're pouring the, into the economy. So that's an in, incredible amount of money. So how this stimulus package affected our business? Maybe some of us did not get anything. Some of us uh, applied to everything and there's a lot of businesses out there that did not get a piece of this stimulus package. Some of us only received maybe the advance of the EIDL. Some of us received the advance and more funds. Some received the PPP, the payroll protection program that was mainly for uh, assisting the business with payroll, uh, with rent and utility bills, okay? Maybe some folks out there received both. Am I surviving today because I was able to receive some of this funding, but my business is not what it used to be? Is it going to rebound? I, what do I need to do? How can I best use these funds if things are not rebounding the way I expect it to rebound? This is something that you need to, to take a good look. Am I being on artificial life support because of these funds, or is my business really doing well? So that is something that you need to look at. Just because you have money in the bank as a result of these programs doesn't mean that you are moving in the right direction. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's the things that we need to check up real quick in regarding the financials of our business. How are our sales? Are the sales what they used, should be for this month? Like I said, compare your P&Ls from this year to 2019? Am I tracking the where I'm supposed to be? Are they moving up? I know there's gonna be a couple of months there, for sure March and April that were down, but am I rebounding the way am I supposed to? So how are my sales doing? How are my accounts receivable? Are my clients paying? Are those checks for those invoices that I have out there coming in? Or am I getting no answers? or people saying, I'm sorry, you're gonna to have to give me more time, or is the money coming in okay? How about my own accounts payable? Am I, am I being able to keep with them and really from the sales revenues coming in, not from any uh, stimulus package money that you got in there? That was nice during those low months of maybe half of February, March, and April. But are right now, being a, am I able to keep up with my bills? What is my cash flow? Am I still making sales on credit, but my cash is not quite there? Do I know my break-even point, and am I, am I there, or am I closely approaching it? If you are not at your break-even point, if you are below your break-even your break point, it is time to look at downsizing. And one of the big pieces of downsizing is the workforce. So let's go to the next slide, please. And I'm going to let B 
Vicky go ahead and address the issues regarding the human factors of your business when you are facing maybe downsizing. You realize it's ine inevitable and you got to start with your workforce in many cases. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you all for taking um, time out of your afternoon. I know this isn't always an easy topic or one that we look forward to um, talking about or even having to think about implementing, but I think it's really important that we do in the event that we have to have some type of downsizing in our organization and um, be able to plan for it some. Um, so next slide, please. What I want to do in this presentation portion is talk about why we downsize. Um, first, several potential factors. One, we just lack of work. You know, the work isn't out there. I think some businesses are finding that right now. Um, what do I do with my employees? I can't con uh, uh, continue to keep them on the payroll. Um, or maybe it's the organizational restructure. Um, you industries in our area, some of them are seeing a shift and um, i.e. the um, aircraft industry is seeing a shift. So you may have to start thinking about what you can do differently and how you go about that. Um, also, you're looking at potential cost savings. Um, Payroll tends to be one of the higher costs for businesses, and so you know you're going to have to make some adjustments there. Um, so look at what those cost savings are. When you think about it, you've got your payroll, what you're paying your employees, then what you're contributing in benefits, whether it's health insurance or others' retirements. Um, you also have your taxes, your employment taxes, unemployment that you have to pay in. Um, training dollars. So there are a lot of different components to that that you may be able to adjust to see some of those cost savings. Um, and again, as an employer, you hate to think about having to do any type of downsizing with your employees, knowing how it's going to impact them. Uh, right now, with um, COVID-19 and what's taken place, there has been some government assistance that has helped. So it makes it a little more palatable knowing that employees are going to be um, getting more than just what they would normally receive through the state. There's been that as additional assistance. So that's been another reason to look at the downsizing component. Um, next slide, please. Here we want to talk about what are some potential considerations or approaches that you can take in reducing or downsizing your workforce. Um, there's the potential of furloughs, layoffs, reduction in work hours, attrition, voluntary separation program, and then the Kansas Shared Work Program, which falls in line with the um, reduction in work hours. I'm going to step to that one um, first. And it's just a matter of looking at what work you do have available and um, how you may be able to adjust those hours that may result in cost savings um, to your budget. Um, attrition, it's looking at hiring freezes. You don't fill positions that are becoming vacated. That's just kind of a natural approach, uh, not quite as hurtful to um, or harmful to employees, potential of a voluntary separation program. You as, an, as a business owner know that you're going to be looking at making some type of um, reductions and want to put it out there. I've got a voluntary separation program. You offer that to individuals if there's anybody that voluntarily wants to separate. You need to be really careful in how you word that and approach it to so that you're not, employees don't feel like they're being forced to, but it's, a, it's an opportunity that they can volunteer for. And what it does is it allows them to do that, to step away and then other employees to be able to stay instead of maybe um, going into deeper reductions in force. Um, and then when you look at reducing your work hours on your employees, that may make you and your employees eligible to participate in the Kansas Shared Work Program. 
They still receive unemployment benefits, but it's at a reduced um, benefit load. They get that, there's assistance. There are certain requirements that as an employer, you would need to um, verify that you would meet those eligibility requirements and you can go to the Kansas Department of Labor's website to do that. But it's really a program that benefits both the employee and the employer. Next slide, please. Here I'm going to talk about specifically furloughs and layoffs um, and what are the differences between the two. Furloughs generally tend to be a shorter time period and most of the time they have a defined time frame of when that's going to occur. My husband was impacted by this and he was placed on a furlough with pay for a certain period of time and then after that um, without pay. But was a defined period of time. Part of it was paid, part of it was unpaid, but at the time through furloughs, employees stay on the payroll. Um, they retain their employee benefits in most cases, but they're also eligible for the unemployment benefits. If you're looking at layoffs, generally they're for a longer period of time and an indefinite period. You just don't know what that's going to be. Um, and it may be that they're permanent. You know for a fact that you're eliminating positions, you've got to cut your workforce. Um, in a layoff, employees are no longer on the payroll. You end up separating them from your payroll. You talk to them about benefits that are terminating and what their options are for continuing, i.e. health insurance through COBRA. Um, layoffs are unpaid. But in the layoff scenario, that individual, those employees are eligible for unemployment benefits. Next slide, please. As always, whenever we're taking um, actions or steps like this with our workforce, um, you always, as an employer, want to think about legal considerations. Um, this list here is not all encompassing but at least gives you a good start to consider when you're looking at that approach and process. Um, the WARN Act, this re generally applies to employees, employers with 100 or more employees, and if you're looking at doing a mass layoff or a site or a whole unit, uh, but it requires you generally to give 60-day notice to the employees that are being laid off, um, there are some exceptions to that um, rule, but so you would need to become familiar with those. And one of those is um, unforeseen business circumstances. Um, COVID-19 potentially could fall into that, but you definitely want to consider and maybe even looking at legal counsel for advice on that. Um, just consider any anti, all of your different anti-discrimination laws, any of those protected categories, gender, sex, um, sexual orientation, age, marital status. You have to consider and want to make sure that you're not discriminating intentionally or unintentionally at, um, with any, anyone that falls into those categories. Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, um, and individuals that are on FMLA or workers' comp. Again, you want to make sure that you're looking at those cases individually and that you can identify and document a specific business reason for making the decisions that you're making. And that's the other thing I would say with all the way through considering um, a reduction in force or some type of downsizing, you want to be sure that you document, document, document everything that you're doing. Um, that's for your protection and for your employees' protection. And I know we in human resources use those terms all the time, but it really is important to consider and do that. Um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, um, if employees are on furlough, they're not eligible for um, that extended leave, just as a note for you to um, keep in mind. Also, sometimes when you're looking at those layoffs or downsizing, um, 
you, you need to think about ERISA and the benefits that you offer and how those come into play. Um, sometimes that's a piece that gets kind of pushed to the side. Um, but if you have any benefits in your plan documents, you need to be sure and become familiar and evaluate those as you're making your decisions on how you're going to approach reductions in force. Um, next slide, slide please. <coughs> Here, um, there are a number of different approaches that you can take for um, can implementing any type of layoffs. Um, you as an employer need to think about your organization, your business, and um, understand you know the culture, you know the employees, and think about these different approaches and what's going to be best for your employees and your organization. Um, the first step would be, or an option that you could consider is seniority-based selection. And this is last hired, first out, so to speak. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, this is an option. This one, you're really rewarding employees for their service with you as an employer, um, their tenure, so to speak. Um, you have to be cautious or something to think about is when you're doing that, that sometimes tends to indicate that you are um, keeping your older, your, there's less risk for age discrimination with your older population of employers, but you also need to think about sometimes that means that you're keeping those individuals that may not have um, necessarily the strongest skill sets or may not be as technically sav technologically savvy in, what, in the work that they're doing. Um, it's just a consideration and something for you to evaluate. Employee, <coughs> excuse me, status selection. Um, this is looking at part-time, full-time, contingent workers. If you, this may not meet the needs that you got for any type of a reduction in force, especially if you're looking at cost savings, if your workforce isn't highly contingent workers or part-time, but it is another approach um, that you can consider. Merit-based selection is more focused on performance. Managers tend to, um, like to go with this because they see it as an opportunity to um, get rid of or um, in terminate those employees whose, per whose performance isn't quite up to par. Um, I caution you to, if you're looking at considering using the merit-based process just because you want to make sure that that performance um, has been documented, not just documented, but also communicated with the employee. Um, so just something to evaluate. The more objective that you can make your criteria when you're considering layoffs, the better off you're going to be. Merit-based isn't always, um, doesn't always fit that particular criteria. Skills-based selection. Um, identifying what your skill set needs are, and then um, keeping those individuals that meet those skill sets and um, letting those individuals who maybe don't have that skill set go. Um, again, you could be opening yourself up potentially for age discrimination for older workers, um, which is at age 40 and above. Um, but again, it's something to consider. Just knowing what the pros and cons of each of these different criteria are is really important for you. Um, the other last one I have listed here is multiple criteria ranking. And this is where you may take some elements of all of these um, criteria and incorporate into it. If you're going to do that, you want I would suggest that you put together what those different skill sets are that you're looking for, um, performance, maybe attendance, things that you've got uh, documented and can support. Um, 
put them together in a spreadsheet, rank and identify how you're going to weigh those, and then apply them to all of the employees that you're considering um, letting go. Next slide, please. <coughs> Here I thought it just might be helpful to have just kind of a general checklist for you to consider um, when you're looking at um, any type of downsizing. Um, again, like I said, it's not anything that we want, we like to talk about or like to think about, but you really need to tie, take the time and do that. Um, what I have here really ties back to all of the other pieces um, that I've referenced in the presentation. First one is identify your goals and objectives. Why are you looking at, um, at downsizing? If it's cost savings, okay, identify what um, that dollar amount is that you maybe need to um, eliminate from your expenses. Um, put together a team that's going to help in making those decisions. Um, identify if you've got more than one location, is it gonna be at certain locations, are it gonna be different specific types of positions? But identify what your goals and objectives are for that particular um, reduction in force. Then start drafting a plan. Um, establish, identify who's gonna be helping making those decisions. Um, business departments that are going to be um, affected and what those uh, objectives are again. Then look at, you know, what kind of elements are going to come into play or um, what approaches are you going to take? Is it going to be um, furlough? Or are you just going to be addressing attrition? But what are the different elements that, are going, that you're going to implement to help you reduce that force. Um, include that in it. Put together a timeline so that everyone knows what you're working with and when it's going to start happening and how. Um, I would also encourage you to have legal counsel review it um, and then uh, move forward from there legal considerations when you're making those decisions. Um, make sure that you're looking at and evaluating any policies and procedures that you have in your employee handbooks or that you've not put into a handbook but you still have in place. Um, if you're a union, you need to look at collective bargaining agreements and make sure that you're complying with any language that's been negotiated and then any type of employment contracts that you may have with your employees. Um, and then you can also determine what um, and if you're going to have any type of uh, severance package that you're going to offer to your employees, um, if you are, what that is. And then throughout this whole process, I think it's really important that you communicate communicate, communicate with your employees. Um, also with individuals that are going to be on your team and making those decisions with you, you want to make sure that you have um, trained them, that they're aware of the plan that you've put together and the approach that you're taking so that they can implement it correctly. Um, but always communicate it each step of the way in the process with your employees. That's not always easy to do. As a matter of fact, it's really difficult. Um, I've been in those situations, but we all know that the impact it's having on us, but we also know the impact that it's having on those employees. Um, I didn't include this in the, my part of the presentation, but um, if you're looking at and having to reduce your force, um, be human and do what you can to assist your employees through the process. Identify resources um, and what they can do to um, get through it. 
Um, you can look at talk, telling them how they go about applying for unemployment. You can talk to them about um, their benefits and what they need to do and um, the status of, of those. But do everything you can um, as an employer and a business owner to work with those employees and make it as easy as, as um, smooth as possible it, as you work through it. And then next slide, please. <clears throat> I've listed here a number of, or shared a number of different um, resource links that uh, might be helpful as you're going through this process. And it may be, again, that you're not having to do something right now, but you anticipate that down the road you might have to. So it's really important to start planning. Um, and then if you're doing this, you might also want to consider looking at um, having policies in place um, to support these efforts. And now I believe I'll turn it over yes. to our Thank next you. panelist. Thank you. So next slide, next please. Slide, please. Perfect timing. Yeah. Is that the one? Yeah. Okay. Um, I believe. Next can slide. you go to the next one, please? Uh, okay. Here. There you go. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Abdul Arif. I'm primarily uh, a business guy, but um, also have been a practicing attorney for about a dozen years. Uh, so I have uh, some considerable experience in uh, bankruptcy and especially in restructuring and renegotiating the existing notes and the accounts payable with your creditors. So first off, as this um, slide suggests, first determine if your situation is temporary and if so, for how long that way it's a, especially in post-COVID type of situation, the bankers are more than happy to renegotiate uh, any terms, including lowering the interest rate, uh, moving the pay payments from the front to the back end, um, making interest-only payments, just lots and lots and lots of options available. Then, of course, the most important one is secured versus unsecured. And then I'm going to add something to the slide. Uh, that question uh, is, is the notes and the accounts that are payable by your company, are they personally guaranteed or not? So sometimes it's, uh, if they're not guaranteed by you personally, it might just be simple just to dissolve the corporation and start fresh and work out some sort of an arrangement with the people you owe money to. It's not obviously the best option for the creditor, but you got to do what you got to do to survive. And the last one on the slide is how to use allocated funds. Clearly, the most important one is to allocating funds is the one of what you need the bare minimum to keep the lights on. I mean, literally the lights on. How much do you need to pay the electric bill or the gas bill? Even they are willing to work with you if they, you have an accumulated balance. They were willing to work with you, but probably the most important part is never ever try to stiff the employees out of their money. So that is a big, huge no-no. Uh, if you need to reduce their pay or figure out some sort of an incentive to keep them on, that's all well and good, you could do that. Um, I've had lots of clients who, who were expecting the, uh, the, especially in the restaurant business, they were expecting the restaurant to stay open and they were counting on the revenues coming in in the future weeks and, and along with it, how they would pay the payroll. Well, this COVID thing was kind of nasty. Just suddenly, I remember the key date was March 18th or so when everything just kind of shut down. So payroll was due March 23rd, 25th, 
and there's no money to pay the payroll. So lots and lots of businesses wrote hot checks, and I know a lot of them that had now uh, chickens have come home to roost, and they will have to be answering to to the Department of Labor, the IRS, and everybody else. So clearly, that's a big no-no. Simply uh, figure out a way to help to allocate funds. Literally, everybody on earth can wait for their money except to employees. So please, let's keep that in mind. The most important person you need to pay before yourself, before the tax guy, before you pay the employees. The second most important person to pay is the tax man. And then everybody else can take, take uh, stand in line to get what you got. So second slide, please. So as I kind of um, um, touched on it a little bit earlier, and what my, my colleague here um, emphasized over and over is to keep lines of communications open all the time with creditors. They're always willing to listen because it's their jobs on the line because creditors often owe money to other creditors. So it's a chain reaction that you're setting up. So at the end, the biggest creditor of them all is guess who? The American taxpayer. And the American, the US government and all the local entities are just pass through entities. In other words, they take money from you for more taxes, print money, and give it to you. So it's the, literally the SBA now is the lender of last resort. But you don't even need to get that far. You can simply negotiate with your banker, the note holder, the landlord, because landlord, guess what? I'm a landlord of a commercial property. I want my tenants were not paying. So I went to my landlord, uh, my banker, and I said, hey, tenants are not paying, so I can't pay you. So, so therefore, my banker or the real estate notes that I have, very understanding. I say, hey, we'll give you 90 day extension, 120 day extension, however your situation allows you to recoup, build up your cash, and then pay off. So lots and lots of options to people, including uh, just like this thing points out, in asking for deferrals. Now, forgiveness is touchy. Nobody forgives anything except the US government. You can, of course, uh, uh, form a line and file for bankruptcy, but then that really should be your last resort. You really, truly should be your last resort. And I'm saying that as a bankruptcy attorney because I don't want to turn away business, but sometimes, in fact, a lot of times, you can negotiate and work your way out of it until, and sometimes bankruptcy is really not a financial decision as much as it's an emotional decision. Emotional decisions, people are sick and tired of dealing with this stress, even though they may be able to work themselves out, but they don't have the energy to do it. That's where people like me come in and help you work through the process of restructuring it, renegotiating on your behalf, because most people who are financially strapped are generally either in denial that something bad is going to happen to them, or they're in la-la land until the, the repo man comes picks up your stuff. So either of those are terrible options to be, to see, simply seek legal counsel. There's lots and lots of uh, nonprofit agencies that also do it, including Frank right here. He can probably be just as, almost just as good as I am in, in, in matters of, of renegotiating, helping out with the creditors. I come in only when he cannot help you anymore, and then it's time to go through the court system. And that can happen too. So dealing with the aftermath, oh, let me talk about the, the forgiveness. So I'm sure those of you who have received the PPP money, there's some very clear guidelines that are being, uh, you know, the, the first final rule came out about a month ago as to what is exactly forgiveness. Then they came back and said, oh, that's not the final rule. The final rule is still being developed. So the last time I heard the repayment must not, uh, uh, you have until December to spend the money, if I remember right. And then there's some criteria, fairly simple, and that really should be your best route to have, like my predecessor said, document, document, document everything and make your job easier to ask for forgiveness from the PPP folks. All else fails, dealing with the aftermath, come see me. It's too complicated to explain what 
the kind of secured debts, what kind of unsecured debts, what kind of preferred creditors are. That's too complicated. I don't want to give you a primer of bankruptcy law. Hope none of you are contemplating it. But if you are, please come see me. So is there another one? Slide? Oh, this is it. There you go. Okay. I guess I got a little bit ahead of my, myself. So legal ways to restructure debt. Very simple. You prioritize what debt is the most crucial for your business. Clearly, your inventory and your uh, tax debt, if you have some, those would be your most important. You cannot stiff, if you're a restaurant owner, you cannot stiff your food supplier because you don't have no food to sell. Most entrepreneurs or, or think that they're clever, they, there's like four or five food suppliers, they go to one and then they use up the credit and they don't have money to pay, they go to the second one and then, then they use up the credit there and they go to the third one. It's a terrible strategy. Uh, stick with whoever you need to stick with. Talk to them if you can't pay them. These most food companies that I deal with, they also have very similar programs like banks. They are willing to take payments, they are willing to extend credit because they want to sell you stuff. So, so use that to your advantage. They want to sell you stuff. If you're in food business or any kind of inventory business, you know, in, if you buy inventory to sell for reselling purposes, same situation. Your suppliers are willing to sell, and they need to unload the their merchandise because it costs them money to store it. They rather give it to you and hope they can recoup some of it, especially in food business because it spoils. So that food needs to be moving constantly. So legal ways to restructure the debt. Uh, most promissory notes and loan uh, documents usually have some provision in there that allows you to restructure. It almost always is in the favor of the banker. Very seldom have I seen things that allow you to restructure debt. So basically when to remember you are worth more to the bank alive than debt. So as long as you're working, as long as so, some money is coming in, the bankers are very surprisingly reasonable people, despite what you might think. Uh, until they realize, hey, look, there's nothing more coming out of you. And at that time, they will force you into an involuntary, involuntary bankruptcy. That's when you need to come see me. So selling in a down market, I don't know, it's, um, it's like anything else. Um, selling in a down market, selling, would, the business. selling the business in a down market was obviously a really a bad idea because nobody wants your business when it is, when it is um, has no cash flow or low cash flow or your sales are low, unless you yourself have the ability to ride out the storm. Insolvency and legal questions, uh, legal answers. Let me tell you, from a bankruptcy perspective, the, but the only thing that is truly, truly non-dischargeable, truly non-dischargeable is your child support, surprisingly. Then comes your tax debt. That's fairly high. I mean, that's almost very high, and then uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Child support is first you almost, it's impossible to get rid of it. Not that I'm suggesting one should, but it's your legal obligation as well as, 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 well as moral obligation. Most government entities, but that type of debt will survive to your grave and you will pass your grave sometimes. Um, then next comes, you gotta pay your lawyer and lawyer doesn't move until you pay him. So. <laughs> you, you really can't go much much further in this business without paying him. So, but at this point, I'm gonna, I don't want to sound like a, a vulture at this point, but unfortunately, we are charged with orderly dissolution of the estate, so to speak. The estate as in your house, your personal belongings, and your business belongings. So we can find some very creative ways to strategize and be able to discharge most of your debt, if not most of your debt. Um, and those are some of the ways you can cope with. So taxes is almost 
impossible to discharge. But guess what? IRS takes payment fines too. And at some point when you are unable to pay the IRS, there's such a thing called offering compromise, OIC. It's a very unique animal that the IRS is really not interested in litigating. They just want the money. And whatever they can come to get out of you, they're fine with it because I expect in the next six months to 12 months, their, their file of unpaid tax is gonna go through the roof. And the people who do the settlements are like, just like you and I, they're, they're career government bureaucrats. They're interested in closing out the file and getting to the next one so they can appear productive to their bosses. So they will take almost any reasonable offer that you can offer them to pay and they will put you on a payment plan and close the file and forget until you default and they'll come back after you. And then it's the next one. So it's really not as difficult dealing with the IRS um, or other creditors. So again, to re-emphasize bankruptcy is almost always, in my opinion, a, more, a what you call an emotional decision as opposed to a financial decision, especially on um, small businesses. Now, of course, big business like airlines and like that is anything but emotional. It's all number driven. But for small businesses, especially that's the forum we're in, for small businesses, it's almost always emotional and, and people are simply tired and they just want to give up and move on to something. And maybe they want a job like Frank, and I'd like to have his job someday. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice, cushy job talking to people and, and trying to find Yeah, I, I, will trade <laughs> I will trade you too. I will trade you too. On that note, I shall leave you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, last slide, please. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and type in under the chat box, and Emily will be uh, checking them out. Uh, I want to tell you again, this is, uh, even though it got lighthearted there at the end, uh, this is not a fun topic, and, and we really debated what was the best way to bring this. But in light of, of the crisis, because it is a crisis, in the light of some things in the new normal that we have not uh, got your ar our arms around, we, we felt this was needed. Just a couple of comments on both what Vicky and, and Abdul said. You know, communication is important, but make sure that you, and, and constant, but make sure it's strategic. Because when you talk too much, there's a chance that you will also make several mistakes. So when you're communicating with whoever you're communicating, make sure that is consistent, that you have checked the legalities of what you're gonna say, what you're gonna promise, what you're gonna share with the audience, whether you're employees, whether you are, they are your creditors, whether they are people that owe you money, make sure that even though the communication must be constant, it also needs to be strategic because otherwise you're going to say something that probably was not the right thing to say. So thanks again. And Emily, do we have any questions? Apparently we do not, we do not have any questions. Um, I was hoping that, that there will be some again, Remember There's your chat. Those are um, from earlier. We um, we are here at Wichita State University Business Development Center, uh, ready to serve you with any type of uh, business questions, assistance on these and more. Uh, even even in these times, there are folks that are trying to start a business, and, and we're here to do that. Please check our website, give us a call, and hopefully we'll be able to, oh, okay. We are, here we have a question. So we're gonna let uh, Mr. Arif handle that. How, what happens if you're in a situation where you have a lease and your business is not able to fulfill that lease? What are some of the things that you can tell? The Simply, the, the first question is, um, what is the length of your lease? What's the remaining balance? How many months? 
That's the first question. So if it's, what, is the, what does that mean? If it's short, it's if it's short amount left, it's easier versus if it's correct. And I only have seven months left versus I have four years correct. left. Most important, did this person sign a personal guarantee? 24 months just reviewed. Okay. So is this a triple net commercial lease or a, uh, or a residential lease? Probably a commercial lease. It's commercial lease. So would you talk a little bit about of the course. difference between a, a, a lease on the business or if there's a personal guarantee on the lease? Correct. Uh, commercial second location. Okay, this is what I looked at, I'm Mr. Thomas Mills. Uh, the question I would look for in your lease, there should be a clause. A lot of leases have it's called force majeure. M A J E U R E. Force majeure. What that make? What that means? It's a Latin term for a short form for act of God. Okay, let me put it. So let, let's say. Let's say the the, uh, the building that you're occupying burned to the ground. So there's nothing to fight about. At that point, the asset that you were using for your business burned down or got blown away in tornado. So what we are seeing right now is, um, is COVID equivalent to force major? That is a subjective question. Is it an act of God? It absolutely is an act of God. How else it could it be? How is it different than than uh, the tornado? How is it different than the Nancy catching on fire? You can't get back in. So, but then again, it depends on your type of uh, situation. Was it a restaurant? Was it a retail outfit? Was it were there some restrictions by the government for you that prohibited you from doing business? And for instance, did your establishment say, hey, only five people at a time or 10 people at a time, like a classic example of a gym? You know, there were all kinds of restrictions. Was it your barber shop? Those were the ones that were hardest hit. Anything that had up close or personal contact. So there's a possibility. I mean, he needs counsel, obviously, yes. but uh, there's a possibility that this major force, force uh, majeure, force majeure uh is is a, applicable in your situation o obviously we cannot figure that out here but now you know that there's a possibility that if this, if well, this COVID it could be the reason why you're in that situation there could, without Seeing giving that. an opinion we can say you need to explore that option I hope that answers the question. Okay. Very well. I think that's something I would say, probably from all of our perspective, this is something that is totally new and um, it, we're treading in new waters. And so I think we're gonna see a lot of these questions and how do we handle the different situations and scenarios that you may come in, um, may be faced with. and. Um, you may be needing a lot of legal counsel because it is so unknown and not something we've experienced as, as a country before. And, and I'm gonna say this to, to close it, is if you have reached the conclusion, a sound uh, not like, like our attorney was saying, not an emotional decision, although sometimes it is what it is, but remember the first one to the gate has a better chance because let's say that you're in a business that are many business similar to yours that are going through a problem. Well, if you have decided to close the doors and maybe you have inventory, you have assets that you need to sell, the sooner you come to the table with those, probably the better chances are you gonna have to sell them and to sell them for a better plot price than if you wait three months when everybody else has gone in front of you, and please, we're not saying, go ahead and hurry up and close the doors. Please hurry up and have a fire sale. That's not what we're saying. Every decision that you need to make when it comes to downsizing or even exiting your business must be a strategic one. You know, if you need more information on HR, you know, 
here, here we are. If you need more information in legal terms, there is there is many uh, attorneys in Wichita that you can that you can go to, uh, including our our, our uh, guest here. If you need financial analysis, you can come again to Wichita State Business Development Center, and we can look at your numbers. We are confidential, and we're your tax dollars at work. For anything like this, at the Business Development Center, so from Vicky this way, not that way, uh, our services are typically a no direct cost to you. So if, if you are facing a tough situation, do not hesitate to look for assistance. That extra pair of eyes from the outside looking in, that probably will be maybe a little bit more objective than emotional. Make sure that you seek help when you're in a tough situation. So thank you again. Have a wonderful uh, day and please don't hesitate to contact.